Okay, thank you. Thanks, Josh. And thank everybody for uh, being here today. Um, we're gonna be discussing uh, our winter raptor survey program. It's basically gonna be an overview, gonna show you some of the raptors that we might see in winter and a little background about the program itself and how to get involved with it. So let's get started here. Okay, so what is uh, a winter raptor survey? Well, it's basically a, uh, a citizen science project um, for raptor enthusiasts, which I'm sure everybody here is. Uh, it's something for us to do during the off season uh, to go out and look for birds uh, and do some recording of what we do. Uh, and we do it in a systematic way uh, for uh, future studies and research. Uh, why do them? Why do these winter raptor surveys? Well, one, to collect data for population studies. Two, uh, also to collect data for habitat use. Uh, get an idea of what these birds are using in the winter. Uh, do they return to those areas and such? And number three, and maybe one of the most important parts, is because it's fun. Okay, so what do you basically have to do? And we'll get into this a little bit uh, more in a bit here. But uh, number one, you're going to be running a self-designated route. You're going to pick it. Uh, hopefully, it'll be some, in an area where you feel you're going to you know, optimize the number of raptors you see. Um, you're going to identify those raptors, and, you re and you're going to record what you see. You're also going to identify habitat and behaviors, like whether the bird was perched, flying, uh, eating prey, whatever. And then finally, you'll be entering that data online. Okay, so our surveys are basically conducted by uh, from an auto, a car, an automobile, or whatever. And uh, so we prefer that the routes are between 20 and 60 miles. Uh, we're going to be going down hopefully roads for the most part that are uh, safe that you could pull over, uh, and even more safe if you have to get out. Uh, most of the routes, like I say, are done by vehicle, but there are some occasions where you might have uh, a row of trees blocking a prairie and you got to get out and walk onto the other side of that tree line. So you're going to be scanning skies like hawk watchers do. You're going to be looking in trees for perch birds, and you're also going to be looking on the ground. In winter, a lot of times raptors are on the ground, whether they're feeding or whatever they're doing. Um, and you got a whole different ID challenge here than you do with regular hawk watching. This bird, for example, looks kind of dark. Luckily, that bird started taking off, and we could tell that it's a kiting or hovering uh, juvenile red-tailed hawk. You're going to come across situations like this where a rough-legged hawk is going to be somewhat obscured uh, by, by grass or whatever. We don't want to disturb these birds by making them take off in any way. So we're going to have to learn a couple of different identification techniques. It's maybe more like general birding than it is like hawk watching. So this is kind of uh, an example. The, the image on the left is what us hawk watchers see at a hawk watch. And what we see here, and I'm not sure how detailed your screens are, but what we see in that image is uh, a bootio looking bird with its wings uh, pressed forward a little bit, a little squared off on the end, not pointed wing. And if you're fortunate enough to get a view, you can see the crescents in the wing. And if your image is real good here, um, you could actually see the banding in the tail. The thing is, is the bird on the right is what we're gonna be seeing uh, more often on winter raptor surveys. Uh, and both of these are the same species. And the one on the left is an adult red-shouldered hawk. One on the right is a, a juvenile bird. So my point here is, is that doing winter raptor surveys, your, your challenges change a little bit from, from watching specks in the sky coming towards you. And you're gonna be seeing things uh, hopefully closer and having to identify them differently. So when you're driving down a road and you see a rough-legged hawk up in a tree, you'll be able to identify it without spending too much time. Okay, 
So wintering raptors, what might we see um, in the winter? In, uh, and I'm basically talking about the lower 48, uh, maybe a little bit of Canada, but mostly the lower 48. Okay, so uh, I broke this into four different categories. On the left are widespread wintering species. And what I mean by widespread, they're seen all over the United States. Uh, well, no, I shouldn't say that. They're seen in a number of, state, a number of states more than regional. Uh, like red-tailed hawks are seen throughout pretty much the entire lower 48. The middle group of the regional species are somewhat self-explanatory. And the, like, let's say number four there, a snail kite. Well, we're only going to see those pretty much only in Florida. Uh, Crested caracara, we're going to see in a couple of states, but in small areas. The third group, rare winter species, are birds that are either in very small areas or not very not seen very much or uh you know they're just they're just pretty they're fairly rare in winter broadwing hawks we do see them on the coasts in california i mean in florida uh, but those are mostly juvenile birds same thing with swings and swats and then the last group the non-wintering species basically vacate the lower 48 Swallowtail kites do come back in late February, so that got to keep mindful of that. Okay, so we're only going to talk about the 16 birds on the left, not the entire uh, group here. So the vulture species, um, starting with the black vulture, it's the bird that's basically sedentary, uh, although the northeast population does migrate down a little bit. Uh, they, they do go down a little bit into uh, the lower uh, southeast, and, uh, some go into uh, Mexico and such. Um, and so not most, not all the country is going to see them. In winter time, you know, we, we see vultures either perched alone sometimes or flying in groups. Uh, but in winter, I've noticed that black vultures uh, have a tendency to form, uh, I think it's called communal roosting where you'll see a number of them in a tree at one time. Turkey vulture, I think everybody here is pretty familiar with them. Uh, the Eastern population migrates pretty much down to the Southeast part of the country and into Mexico a little bit. But the Western subspecies, that group uh, pretty much vacates uh, the West uh, and then there's another group of uh, vultures in Western California that stay there year round, pretty much. This is how you'll come across uh, vultures generally. Uh, they'll be feeding on some carrion or whatever. And sometimes it's kind of fun to watch their behavior, um, the way they interact with each other. And this is a, you can see that this is a road that's hardly ever used. If you're fortunate enough to see both of them in the sky at the same time, they're pretty easy to identify as hawk watchers. I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. Okay. Um, one thing with a lot of uh, winter raptors, there's some that are a lot more conspicuous than others. Obviously, the bald eagle is one of the more conspicuous ones. <clears throat> and this is a raptor that pretty much leaves uh, most of its Canadian breeding territory and winters in the lower 48. Uh, and a little bit into Mexico. These, these birds um, sometimes could be seen alone in an area, other times and where I personally like to see them is along waterways. And that's where like th this photograph taken on the Mississippi River uh, in Iowa, uh, you can drive down in an hour and see hundreds of uh, bald eagles, sometimes 20, 30 in one tree or a group of trees like this one is. You also see them not only uh, perched, like up in the upper left, uh, but near the top, you see one flying. You'll also see them bordering ice, and they're basically waiting for, for a dead fish or something to come by and to grab it. Um, it's, again, it's fun to watch these birds. February, they do start building nests, um, and you, in a number of places, you could safely view this. Here in uh, Iowa, where I photographed this one, uh, I was quite a bit distance away. And this was a nest that was in existence for many, many years, but a storm had taken it down recently. And you can see, and this photograph was taken in late February, 
Uh, and you can see, I believe it's the female sitting on the humongous nest. One thing that's fun about bald eagles is that their age progression occurs over about four year period. So if you're a photographer, and maybe even if you're not a photographer, just someone that gets a good look at these birds, uh, it's fun to come home with your photographs and get your books out and try to age them. A lot of, a lot of them fall within, you know, whether it's a third year bird and a second year bird, but uh, the thing is, is that it's, it's a riot to do it. So keep that in mind. And even bald eagles can be found on the ground. I'm not sure what this bird was doing. That's how I found it. That's how I left it. Okay, another conspicuous bird in winter is the Northern Harrier. Northern Harriers, again, pretty much uh, vacate most of their Canadian breeding grounds. And when you see them in the winter time, they're pivoting, diving, hovering, cut, whatever they're doing. Uh, they're one of the hardest birds to photograph, I gotta tell you, because just as soon as you anticipate where they go, they're gonna be, they go off in a different direction. Um, but this is a typical scene. They are uh, uh, dimorphic where the males and females do uh, look considerably different with the juveniles looking similar to the females. And who doesn't love seeing the uh, gray ghost, the adult male harrier going across a field? Okay, sharp shin hawks. As hawk watchers at most of the northern sites, uh, we generally see a lot of these birds in migration. Uh, trying to find one in the breeding territories is next to impossible. And after that, trying to see one in a winter raptor survey is not likely. It's generally by chance, unless you know of one that is hanging to a specific area. But they're basically going to stay in forests, may see them occasionally near feeders, things like that. But this is one bird that although uh, we do see a lot during migration, we don't see a lot of them uh, on winter raptor surveys. Cooper's hawk, on the other hand, is one that we do see on winter raptor surveys. It's a bird that perches more out in the open uh, and it it's moves around a lot more in the open than the sharp shin hawks. Um, one thing about the Cooper's hawks is that they've become very acclimated to urban surroundings. Uh, by the way, this is the only photograph I didn't take. Um, and um, you, we're starting to see them even in the city like Chicago or Minneapolis, like this article was written. And this particular photograph was taken probably about five miles from where I live. It's a residential neighborhood. And in that tree was sitting that, that bird right there, that Cooper's hawk. Um, the photograph was taken in late February, but um, early March, I believe. But within a week, it started pair bonding with a male and they had built a nest actually in that very tree. And people were walking right by it, that tree, uh, and the birds, the, they stayed right in the area, never left the area. So we're starting to see them more in winter in residential areas, urban areas. You may even see one on the way to your route uh, doing your winter raptor survey, just flying across the road in a, in a you know, in a, in an urban area. So. Uh, we see them a lot more. Goshawks, uh, this is the most awesome exhibitor. Um, again, uh, seeing them in the winter raptor surveys is pretty hard. The more they're seen more in the north than they are uh, throughout the lower 48. But if you see one, oh boy. Okay, the bootios. The bootios will start with the red shouldered hawk. Uh, there's uh, multiple subspecies, I believe four that are accepted. Uh, one where that question mark is kind of. Um, and this bird in the east pretty much does migrate out of its upper regions uh, into uh, the lower part. Uh, most of the country in the west does not have red shouldered hawks except for uh, California. Adults and juveniles do look different, similar to um, red tails, but even the same subspecies looks different. These, were, these two birds were photographed about 50 yards apart. I felt that they were probably a pair uh, because when one took off, the other took off. The very next morning when I drove down that road, they were almost in the exact same spot. 
So you can see some variation here. Uh, over the years, I've probably photographed about 100 individual uh, red-shouldered hawks where I got a good front view like this. And there's no two alike. Okay. Talking about no two alike, let's talk about red tails a little bit. Um, this is a, a raptor that uh, we could see just about anywhere in the country at any given, well, not any given time maybe, uh, but um, we see them, they're quite common, let's call it. Uh, they vacate their Canadian breeding territories also and uh, migrate into the lower 48. Adults and juveniles do look different as we're all uh, familiar with. And one thing that we see, and we, we even see this sometimes with uh, resident birds uh, at this time of the year. At our hawk watch here in Illinois, we've got a pair that nested here recent, uh, this past spring, I should say. And we're seeing them doing uh, flight displays with each other, uh, perching close together. Uh, again, when one takes off, the other takes off. This photograph though was taken in late February. And typically that's when you'll start seeing more pair bonding. Seeing something like this is not uncommon. Although the winter raptor survey does not require um, recording of subspecies, I'm only bringing it up for one reason, that it's fun to learn this. Um, and if you can learn it and you can differentiate, uh, which can be quite difficult uh, at times, um, that's a great thing to add. Uh, there are a lot of ongoing studies uh, right now, uh, and we'll talk about one briefly here. Uh, but what you're seeing here in this map is that most of the subspecies that migrate, um, that live in the Can Canadian area, do migrate uh, out of their breeding territory. Uh, this is just one. It was a uh, juvenile Harlan's hawk with the telltale spikes. And... On the left here, you're seeing a very obvious Eastern Borealis uh, red-tailed hawk. The one on the right, we start to talk about. Uh, it was also photographed in Illinois, but in the winter, the birds got a little bit heavier patagio marks. Belly band maybe looks a little different, dark throat. It's got um, a banded tail that you, you can kind of see in this photograph. But they start getting even more varied uh, red-tailed hawks uh, and all these photographs were taken in the east. I don't, uh, didn't put any Western birds here. Um, so you can see this one's got dark throat. Uh, it's got light upper tail culverts. It's got a blobby looking belly band. The thing is, is that there's, like I mentioned, there's ongoing studies with these birds and we're still not 100% sure what's going on. I highly recommend everybody uh, read this article here. Uh, it's uh, on the, the Northern Red Tail, the Abia Ticola by Jerry Laguerre, Brian Sullivan. The discussion on this proposed subspecies has been going on for almost 100 years now. Uh, and I believe we're going to start finding more and more out about them. We also get a lot of dark birds coming into, uh, into the lower 48. Oh, this morning, I did, like it... Um... So um, keep an eye out for these birds too. There's some question whether they're Western birds or whether they're a dark form of the Northern. That has not been resolved yet, uh, but hopefully it will one day. Uh, there is some evidence that a lot of these birds in the Western provinces of Canada do migrate Southeast. This is a study that was done over several decades. Uh, this was uh, done up with banding uh, data. Whereas recently, the Red-Tailed Hawk Project um, has, has uh, had GPS sensors and took two birds from uh, British Columbia and found out that they uh, have now uh, moved all the way into uh, eastern Kansas, western uh, Missouri. So the thing here is don't worry about subspecies too much, but if you want to see a lot of them, go to a place like Hawk Ridge. Uh, a trip that my wife and I took in 2016, late October. In three days, they had counted well over 3,000 red tails. Although a lot of them didn't come real close, uh, probably 100 to 150 did. I photographed probably half of them. And this is just a small sample of what you might see. 
So, like I said about with bald eagles, you go home, you start looking. This is going to even be more trying and maybe more fun, depending on how you look at it. But the thing is, just have fun with these birds. Just identify, if you can't give it to a subspecies, just call it a red tail, and, because that's what it really is. Okay. Uh, Ferruginous hawk I included in the widespread species uh, because it is seen in the multiple states. Um, the Cornell maps here that I'm using are, uh, are accurate, but they're not real specific. This particular Ferruginous hawk was photographed in South Dakota in late December. Uh, the map shows that that's just breeding and not wintering, but um, that's not 100% the case. I could tell the whole story about this photograph, but we'll save that for another time. If there's one raptor that depicts winter, it's the rough-legged hawk. This is a bird that completely vacates its breeding grounds in the, in the high Arctic uh, and resides in the lower 48 and a bit of upper Canada. This is a bird that's just so comfortable with winter. Uh, I've got more photographs and have seen more uh, just on the ground. Uh, and like this bird here, it looks so content. It, it looks like it's about ready to fall asleep. Not sure I could do that sitting in the snow like that, but uh, it's, it, it's what you see. Rough-legged hawks happen to be my most favorite raptor. Uh, we do see them uh, hovering like this bird here is. Uh, they're also dimorphic uh, to some extent. The you know, females do look different than the males. Um, not quite as obvious as the harrier was, but there are differences and you can see them in flight also. And yeah, that male on the right is carrying a rodent. And they are uh, polymorphic, uh, meaning there's more than one morph or phase, but whatever you want to call it. The one on the left is a light juvenile. The one on the uh, uh, right is a dark uh, juvenile. And who doesn't love dark adult rough-legged hawks? To me, they're the most spectacular bird there is, especially when they're flying low over uh, sunlit snow. And that snow just acts like a reflector. Again, uh, I had mentioned that red-shouldered hawks have a lot of variants. Uh, there are subspecies of red-shouldered hawks to keep in mind. Red-tailed hawks have a lot of variants. There's subspecies there. There's only one subspecies of rough-legged hawks in North America. But of the hundreds of uh, rough-legged hawks that I've photographed, again, it's very rare to find any two alike. These are all perch birds, obviously. And even in flight, top row are all juveniles and the bottom row adults. Even there, you're going to see a lot of variants. You're also going to see some cool behavior uh, between wintering raptors, like the rough-legged hawk here and the, and the harrier. Um, you'll, I've seen this a number of times, and it was first recorded uh, you know, in a paper or a blurb, I should say, in 1957. And what this rough-legged hawk is doing, I'm not quite sure. It never caught up with the harrier, but it looks like that harrier does have something in its talons. So it's a kind of fun thing to record. This is a behavior you see. Uh, golden eagle is our other eagle, and maybe that's an insult because to me it's the most majestic-looking eagle. Uh, we do see these throughout the United States. There's no, they don't really congregate anywhere. There are areas where we may see more than one in uh, several square miles, but not like eagles. They're just very uh, majestic looking birds. And who doesn't love looking up in the sky and seeing those white patches of a juvenile? One thing that's really cool is recently uh, this Bernheim Arboretum and Research Forest has done some studies with uh, uh, GPS tags and in the fall of 2019, the, the male on the left, Harper, the, and the female on the right, uh, Athena, uh, left their um, breeding grounds in uh, late, mid to late October. And approximately a month later, they uh, wintered in uh, this area in Kentucky. You could see they went completely different paths and arrived at the same spot. Um, and they didn't arrive at the same time, 
but within a week or so of each other. In the spring, uh, going back north, again, they left at different times, uh, mid-March or so, they took almost the same path and um, uh, arrived on their uh, breeding grounds uh, in April. Uh, they had uh, both left in uh, October, uh, Athena, the female, October 9th, Harper, the uh, male, October 14th, and Athena arrived on the, on the wintering ground last week on November 9th. And Harper, who's always a little delayed, he's been kind of in Wisconsin a little bit right now, and they're, they're watching. If you go on that website, you'll see uh, a lot of information. It's pretty neat. Kestrels is our last group is the falcons. Kestrels, uh, they're pretty conspicuous birds. I, personally, I see them always on wires for some reason, but occasionally you'll see them perched uh, on something vertical like this and how they're holding on, I have no idea. But, um, and how these little tiny beautiful birds survive the winter is another thing. We do see them even in central Wisconsin in January. Merlin, another bird that we see on migration, uh, but they're inconspicuous to somewhat other than a flash across the sky uh, in the winter. Uh, again, the map, it shows migration for Illinois, but we do get them here in winter in Illinois. Peregrine falcons probably require some more discussion with winter raptor surveys uh, because we're not really sure 100% what we're looking at in winter. The tundraous birds, the high Arctic birds, pretty much migrates to the coast and further south. Uh, but we do have a lot of reintroduced birds. This particular bird I photographed uh, in January of 2019. And um, I was fortunate enough to get an angle where that bird was, uh, I got the tag. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, she's the director of the Chicago Peregrine Program, uh, she uh, looked up the information on this bird, and this bird was born in Racine uh, in 2012, and they had named it Mike. So my only point here is just that when we see prairie fal uh, peregrine falcons in the winter, they're most likely going to be the reintroduced birds, um, and they might be several subspecies. So this is a whole different uh, conversation here, but I uh, just wanted to point it out. And our last falcon, the prairie falcon, pretty much sedentary in the west, uh, very little migration south, but they do migrate a little bit east. We have wintering prairie falcons in Coles County every year for several years now in Illinois. Okay. So the Winter Raptor Survey Program, how do you get started? Well, like I had mentioned, you're gonna be going down roads very similar to this, hopefully, where they're safe to drive on. You can pull over, maybe get out safely without having cars coming by at high speeds. And hopefully you'll be able to see birds like that dark morph uh, rough-legged hawk on that uh, uh, pole over there. Uh, this was uh, photograph was taken in South Dakota. You're gonna go to www.hamana.org, which I'm sure you're all familiar with the website. When you get to the home page, you're gonna go to research and conservation. Uh, click on that. You're going to go, you're going to see this screen, click on winter raptor survey, and then uh, you're going to get to this opening page, which is going to be like a slideshow. Highly recommend you look at this. There's some overview there, some of the things I've discussed, uh, and a few things maybe I haven't discussed. Highly recommend you page through that. If you scroll down, you're going to see three things. On the left is a data entry. Uh, when you get your data filled out on the form, and you go online, that's where you're gonna log in. All we require is an email address, you pick your password, and that'll gain you access to the uh, to, to log, uh, entering your data. Uh, the other two things are the protocol and the form. The protocol is a very detailed uh, document, it's multi-pages, highly recommend you read everything in it, I'm not gonna go over it here, it's a little bit too tedious. Uh, the same thing, um, what I wanted to mention here was that the basics of the Winter Raptor Survey are in uh, the protocol. And it's basically, you're gonna be planning a route. Uh, you're gonna do a trial run. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do a trial run, but we recommend it. Uh, you're gonna take note of different habitats. Uh, for most of us that live in the Northern part of the country, uh, those habitats might be snow covered uh, come mid-December. 
Uh, you're going to submit the route to the committee. The reason why we uh, suggest that is that there's no overlap with existing routes. Uh, maybe a little bit of overlap is okay, but not a big overlap. Uh, and then run routes uh, monthly, uh, basically December, January, February. If you only do one route, we uh, hope you do it in January. And then you're going to submit it all to the login site. The form um, uh, is fairly detailed. I uh, highly recommend you take a clipboard with you and you'll be filling this form out. Um, there's a lot of things here. We do uh, suggest that uh, and hope, actually uh, require that uh, you take GPS coordinates of the locations of the birds that you find. Uh, when you go online, this is the entry page. You're gonna be doing general notes, the weather, subsequent pages are gonna be where you're gonna be entering the, the raptors themselves. Planning a route is a little bit of, a, well, maybe tedious, maybe not. And there's various ways of doing it. You could just run a route, write down your where you turn and all that, you could do it with a ruler at home on a map. You can use a uh, small device like this map measuring tool uh, on, um, um, that you can get the um, uh, detail on. And um, it's, they're, they're under $15 at uh, 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 Amazon. Okay, I don't know where these two blue lines came from. Uh, I got two blue lines. Does everybody see two blue lines going across the screen? I have no idea where that came from. So I'm sorry about that. Vic, they're very minimal and they don't detract from the slide for me. So I think you're okay. Okay, good. Yeah, it just, it just, just popped up for me. Um, okay, so planning a route, we do recommend you use Google Earth. Um, and, uh, and in Google Earth, you can do a lot of things. You're going to go up on the left to an area called path, and then you're going to get a, a dialogue like this. I'm not going to go through this. It only took me an hour to figure it out. I did come up with a, a, a route. This is just a sample route. This one here is basically 25 miles from start to finish, going in clockwise or counterclockwise direction. Yeah, sorry about these blue lines, folks. I have no idea where that came from. Um, Another tool that you can use is a Garmin tool like this. Uh, these are about a hundred dollars or so. You don't, you're not required. But one thing that's nice about this tool is that we like it if you uh, mark in GPS the locations of where you see your birds. And um, uh, just pressing that black button gives you a waypoint. You could download this data into Google Earth. It also came with a free uh, program uh, that you can download. And you can download uh, in a CVS, CSV file, which is like a Excel file um, that you can record all your uh, GPS coordinates. And like for ID number one, you can put red tail hawk. Um, Josh, do you think maybe I should go out of the program, go back in? Do you think that's the problem? I don't know. I guess we'll just. You could try, you could try yeah. getting out of presentation and going back yeah, in. Let me yeah. see if that's the problem here. It's almost it's, like you accidentally drew no, on it. No, no way it's still I could have done that. Yeah, I, I don't know what that is. That's the first for me. It's on the screen. I, that's too bad. Okay. I will tell you it's very, very minimal. And, uh, okay. Yeah, it looks like, like I didn't okay. even move my mouse across the screen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Super weird. All right. Um, so there's also uh, apps that you can use for your phone. Um, I'm not sure which ones work with which phones. I believe Google Earth works with all your phones. There are compass programs. Personally, I like this GPS tracks. It's $3.99. Uh, there is a pro version you do not need that. Uh, here's uh, some of the screens. The home screen is on the left. Uh, and then the waypoint screen where you're marking your birds. And then on the right is a manual that you can download as a PDF. And um, it's, it's really nice to do that because then you can learn how to use this. Uh, when you mark your waypoints, uh, you can see on the left, you get your GPS coordinates um, uh, and where you, how many miles you were from where you started. And then in the middle were all the re, uh, uh, waypoints that I had marked. 
And on the right, with this app, you can actually even take a photograph and you can see a red-tailed hawk sitting on one of the wires. You can also uh, add notes and uh, things like the names of the birds that you see. Uh, you got your time, you got your latitude, longitude, and, and then your notes. It's just, uh, I highly recommend this app to use. Uh, one of the things that's great about GPS coordinates is that um, if you come across, let's say this beautiful male rough-legged hawk, and, uh, but the ground was either you didn't take note of what the habitat was, or it was snow covered. You plug those uh, GPS coordinates into Google Earth or Google Maps for that matter. You know here that it's pretty open territory. You go into street view, and now you can see uh, that it was basically grassland prairie type with some distant trees. So that's kind of a neat thing for doing GPS coordinates. And then when you get back home, uh, recording some of the things that you either didn't have time for or um, uh, that you, uh, you know, the view is obscured somehow. Routes do not have to follow any set patterns. This one here is kind of like a polygon. This one here is kind of a uh, figure eight zigzag kind of thing. And this one here was uh, vertical. Uh, and they saw a lot of birds on this route. Uh, they, it was a route that was 60 miles approximately. They saw 41 raptors. That was a good day there. This is the screen for entering the data, the summary, a little bit of a blow up of that. One thing uh, you're gonna be marking whether a bird is perched or flying. You gotta use your discretion on that. If you're driving down a road and you see this rough legged hawk perched, uh, these photographs were taken seven minutes apart, but because you drove a little bit too close to that bird, maybe it flew away, you're gonna probably write down that if you weren't there, that bird was perched. Just a side note. Every year at the end of the year, a paper, uh, an article is written, Nora Hankey, our prior chair wrote this one. It is available on uh, the Humana uh, website. Uh, I highly recommend you uh, printing it up and reading it. A lot of information here. Uh, we had in 2019, 2020, uh, 32 routes over 12 states. Some states had multiple routes. We saw 20 different species of raptors. Uh, some states saw a little bit more species. Uh, some states saw less. And I think that has probably more to do with geography than anything else. Um, the number of states that saw a number of different raptors, number 13, all states saw red tail. That's not surprising. Oh, good. The blue lines just went away. Um, Figured it out. Yeah. I don't know what happened there. Uh, and then uh, it's not surprising that number five, the snail kite, uh, only saw them in one state. Uh, and the white-tailed kite just above it were seen in Florida and in California, which is also not surprising. So it's kind of cool to start looking at some of this information. There have been papers written. Uh, this one was written uh, here on Illinois Studies. Uh, there's a almost, it was actually a book at one point. This is Keith Bilstein, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It was a dissertation. It's 288 pages, just filled with information on uh, wintering raptors. Um, we would love it if every state had a winter raptor survey, no matter where you're located. Uh, but if I were to highlight some states, it would be these eight areas here. Uh, I personally know that all of them uh, have uh, wintering raptors. Uh, I've never been to Texas in winter looking for raptors, but all the other areas I have been. And I'm only going to talk about two of them. And the first one is uh, Eastern Kansas. My wife and I took a four day trip there uh, in 2014. It was this area of Kansas, uh, about 100 miles north south, I don't know, 30, 40 miles east west. These were the kind of roads we drove on. There was little to no snow on the ground uh, and very, um, very rural roads, let me tell you. But the raptors, oh my God, there are so many that we saw. This is just a sampling from Cooper's Hawks in the left, bald eagle, golden eagle, uh, kestrels, uh, harriers, red-shouldered hawks, and prairie falcons. Another story about that photograph and that bird for another time. What you're not seeing here is red-tailed hawks. 
And the reason is, is because if you want to see lots of subspecies of red-tailed hawks, we saw well over 250 red-tailed hawks in those four days. And I got to tell you, most of them were Eastern Borealis, but we saw several harlands, including the adult uh, bird in the lower right, some heavily marked ones like the one in the lower left, uh, criders types in the upper right. We also saw westerns. Uh, it's just a place to go, and it would be wonderful if we had more surveys done in Kansas. The other area, three-day trip in South Dakota, uh, much colder environment there. Uh, we happened to be there during the time when they had, uh, I don't know if this was freezing fog or a hoarfrost or what this is called, but every day that we were there had, had this kind of look to it. Uh, we were in central um, South Dakota near Pier uh, in that general area uh, where we traveled and we saw lots of harriers everywhere. How they even find anything uh, over that kind of terrain, I have no idea. And why they'd want it while they're hungry, I guess. Uh, we did see three ferruginous hawks on that trip. I got to tell you, on, the, on this Kansas trip and this trip and all of my wintering rap, uh, raptor trips, I'm talking about hundreds of miles you're driving looking for these birds. There's no concentration of them anywhere. Um, so keep that in mind. And if someone were to do a winter raptor survey, they'd have to pick specific routes or multiple routes. Uh, we did see several golden eagles, not my best photograph, but it's a documentation photo. Uh, and we saw several bald eagles. And we saw EGAD number of uh, rough-legged hawks. Not all uh, were close, uh, but most of the images and the views in your binoculars were just something next to beautiful. And look at this red-tailed hawk. It's got, it's got freezing something on it. It's almost like icicles on its body, which is just incredible. But this trip had a couple of rewards. Uh, one day late in the afternoon, we were filling up our car with gas, and I spotted this steer falcon, got close enough to get a photograph, and it was the highlight of winter raptoring. So uh, I just saw another line go up here. Okay, so uh, please consider uh, participating in the winter raptor survey. If you have any questions, go to wrs at humana.org. And just two things here. Uh, because we're going to be traveling on roads and doing this, please stay safe, uh, whether you're just pulling over or getting out of your car or whatever, and also with today's circumstances, stay safe and have a lot of fun doing this. Uh, it's a, just a great time. want to just thank you for your time today. And um, Julie, I think we're done here. If you have any questions, uh, hopefully I can answer, fire away. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much, Vic. That was wonderful. I could look at your photos all day. They're amazing. Thank you. And I'm very excited to do my winter raptor survey this year. Good. Um, we got a few questions. Um, before I jump into those, I just wanted to um, stress how much fun surveys are. And I did my first one last year. Um, I've been doing uh, Eagle surveys for years, but haven't really done a Humana survey. And um, just wanted to say how easy and fun they really are to get a feel for birds that are in your neighborhood, in your region. Um, and also given just what's going on this winter with COVID, uh, it's still possible to get out there. You know, our, our, we do our surveys uh, with my husband and two kids. Uh, so it's an easy way to just stay in your car look at birds and, and still be socially distant from people. So if you can uh, find a way to do it safely, I highly recommend it. We're, we're looking forward to getting all the data we can. Um, somebody, let's see, first of all, we had a question uh, which Josh mainly answered about uh, Northern Illinois, if you could suggest any areas for finding bald eagles. And Josh mentioned, um, in the comments that, um, you know, anywhere where there's open water, obviously, uh, but if you know of any places in particular in Iowa or uh, Northern Illinois. Yeah, definitely. Other than the Mississippi River, not sure where the person lives in Illinois, 
Uh, but the Mississippi River is about eh, maybe three hours from Chicago. I've done that trip in a day and back. Uh, other areas in northern Illinois um, are on the uh, Rock River uh, near uh, uh, Rockford. Um, there's some areas there with open water, and there's like I believe there's a park that you could drive into, and you could see uh, it's like a peninsula, and you could see bald eagles on either side of that park. Uh, and then uh, the Fox River. Uh, there's been uh, at least a dozen bald eagles uh, wintering on the Fox River uh, near Aurora, the Tavia area uh, that we see them are also. And then keep in mind, you can almost see bald eagles anywhere, but there's concentrations along the, the larger rivers. And then the, uh, I'm not sure where he lives again, and still somewhat in Northern Illinois, Star Rock has got dozens of bald eagles, uh, and that's the Illinois River uh, by LaSalle. So. Okay, thanks. Um, also, uh, someone was wondering if um, if you're also looking for diurnal uh, owls, if you could talk about that, or if it's just uh, diurnal. Yeah, I mean, the only one that, although, yeah, it is possible to see great horned owls during the daytime. Uh, it's not generally seen, but we do see short-eared owls. Uh, uh, mostly, uh, you know, uh, towards later in the afternoon. Although I've seen short-eared owls at two o'clock in, in the, you know, mid-afternoon or whatever. Um, but um, we do record those. Uh, I'm not sure we're doing any data studies on that, mostly because uh, it's pretty rare and they're generally in, in local spots and they're not there in the same areas every year. Right. Yep, but by all means, if you're if you're out there on your survey and you see any diurnal owls, by all means, uh, record them. Those are really interesting sightings. Uh, somebody else wanted some clarification about raptors that uh, from one of your early slides. Just which raptors we are focused on? You said somebody said should we focus on those twelve species? Um, but we're we're basically saying all species, right? I mean, it could yeah, be. A yeah, exactly. Depending on where you are. Right. Yeah, if you do your survey in southern Florida, you're probably not going to get rough-legged hawks, uh, but you might get, uh, you know, caracara, snail kite, you know, whatever. You're going to get a whole bunch of things that might not be seen anywhere else. But nobody is really – we do have one survey, but we don't have a lot of surveys in some areas. So, yeah, there's nothing that we're focused on. That Bilstein study – was basically focused on four species, but where he was at, that's really the only thing he was going to see there. So, yeah. Okay. And also, what kind of camera body do you use, Vic, in your lens? Yeah, I was going to put a slide. <laughs> I always include one at the end of these presentations uh, because that is something people like to know. Uh, I basically use a, 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 a couple of different setups. But I, if I had to pick one setup just for Raptors, I use uh, a Canon 7D2. Uh, I also use a, a, a 5D Mark IV, which is a full frame. And the lenses I use are a 400 millimeter DO, uh, the second version with a 1.4 converter on it. Uh, sometimes I take that converter off and use that as my 400 millimeter lens. And then I also have a 300 F2.8 that I put a 2X on and that'll give me 600 millimeter. So for perch birds, I'll use that. Uh, I also have a 500 millimeter lens that I really don't use that much, um, mostly because it's not, I can't move it real fast when I jump out of the car to get photographs and stuff. So I use it more for uh, perch birds and stuff. Or if I got it on a tripod, then, it, then, it's, then I use it for you know, almost anything. But I use the 400 DO and the 300 F2.8 with the 7D Mark II bodies. Okay, that meant nothing to me, but <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, maybe someday I'll get it. Get technical. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you. I hope that was helpful to the people who were wondering. Sure. Um, so uh, I just want to add, I don't see any other questions really. Um, Oh, do you have to take photos? What's that? Uh, somebody is wondering if you have to take photos during oh, your... No, not at all. Not at all. 
No, you don't have to take photos at all. You don't even have to have a camera with you. Yeah, it's not it's not at all required for the surveys. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to uh, say again uh, how how many uh, you know we had. Vic said we had 32 routes. I think last year over 12 states. There's a big country out there full of wintering raptors, and we would love to add more data to our our database um, and just learn as much as we can. We have so much migration data, so much breeding data, and it really um, it goes a long way being able to to understand more about their, their behaviors and populations in the winter. 